Okay, all right. Well, I am Judy Woodward. I am the history coordinator of the Ramsey County Public Library, and I am delighted to welcome this audience in our hall uh, to this uh, uh, talk with uh, Professor Nick Hayes of St. John's College. Um, we originally scheduled this talk for September. Uh, Professor Hayes was not able to make it at the last minute. And at the time, I remember thinking, uh-oh, I wonder if it'll still be a newsworthy topic by uh, February. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> how wrong I was. Maybe it's even more in the news now. So we are delighted to make this program possible. We welcome not only the audience here in the hall, but also our television audience. This program is being simulcast. Um, today, so that's a, a new one for us and we're very happy. We could not do this, we could not do this without the support of our partners, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota, and for the financial support from Minnesota's Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, we give great thanks. And now I'm going to turn the podium over to Professor Nick Hayes. Thank you very much. Where to start, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> as Judy said, I'm Nick Hayes. I teach at St. John's University, but a few in the audience know that for many years I taught not far from here at Hamlin University. So this is a bit of a homecoming for me back in this part of the uh, Twin Cities, uh, but otherwise I, you can find me at St. John's. I want to share with you uh, today a few thoughts on the place of Putin in Russian history the place of Putin in the contemporary domestic context, and what you really, I think, want to hear is his role in shaping a radically new international order over the last 10 years or so. I suspect you might want to ask if he's had some relationship with President Trump, and we can discuss that, and I will share with you as best I can my insights into uh, the connection between President Trump and President Putin. On the interest of full disclosure, I am not from the CIA. Yes, I have had in my career, which is getting pretty long now, I have had such opportunities and declined them. I've declined them from the political department of the State Department as well, and a few other various and sundry agencies. I am, unfortunately, exactly what you see, a mild-mannered uh, uh, professor of history, uh, and I guess that's enough. I want to, my plan for today will be to introduce us, first of all, to a few things about Putin um, and how his image has been politicized recently, and try to talk in depth at the emerging tension and crisis between the United States and Washington, or, and Moscow. I will, in the end, turn to look at the crisis with the Trump administration, the issues of manipulation, as best I can. I remind you, I actually work in Collegeville, Minnesota, not exactly a center of espionage <laughs> and things of that sort. Uh, several times when I've done phoners for various news organizations on these kind of questions, I have to remind them you're talking to a guy sitting at his lake cabin looking out at a frozen lake, uh, about a dozen men ice fishing out there. This is not a major uh, information deposit. And I want to bring things together with a larger thought on Putin's role in the larger play of Russian history. Let me begin on a lighter side. I know you probably already have your 2018 Putin calendars. Uh, I am pleased to say that this year you don't have to go, as I did for the first one in 2017, to Rostov in Russia. Uh, it is now distributed in the United States in seven to eight different varieties. But this is the original one. I like to share it to loosen the crowd up a bit and familiarize ourselves with the way Putin appears in the uh, Russian public today. To do this, that the lead there says, um, every day of the year, with uh, spend the whole year with President Putin. I'm going to flip back here to, and it worked, to the calendar itself. And so this first came out last year. 
Oops, what happened there? Hmm. Something. All right. <clears throat> Yes. Okay, this is a uh, help. Uh, what, I'm sorry, I can't seem to get the... Well, I guess we'll do it this way. So this is the hit. The hit. This, it begins at Christmas time with... <clears throat> begins at Christmas time with... Putin lighting the Christmas Eve uh, candle. It shows Putin in winter recreation, enjoying, the, many of, the, of them show Putin with children, kind of giving a more fatherly but humane image to him. He particularly likes cats and kittens, and this is Putin with a kitten. Uh, this is more the Putin you probably have seen broadcast abroad. Oh, didn't come up? Oh, what's gone wrong here? Something. Is that? All right, how's that? Uh, what do we, what is? I do not know what to do, folks. I think I'll have to disappoint you. It just worked 10 minutes ago. Well, there we go. Well, that one works. There we have Putin in a more macho image. Here we, oh, you don't. Um, I think we'll have to abandon this exercise. Are you just having trouble with the... It's just not. There is there. If you just do it from this uh, over here, okay. So. Here's Putin. Okay, they've got Putin at Christmas. And so if you just Putin with the kitties. Okay. No, we don't. I, th I, have, okay. I have a simple solution here, folks. We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that in a moment. But as I tell my students, whenever you give a talk, always have a backup. There we are. You can peruse this later if you like. I shall leave it here for your enjoyment, but it's a variety of shots of Putin, Putin with children, Putin with holidays, Putin laying uh, flowers at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in conjunction with World War II. Uh, my, a lot of them, Putin, by the way, is a man who is actually quite dedicated. Wildlife in the Russian habitat, particularly Siberia. There are photos of him um, intervening to protect the Siberian cranes. There's also an image of him who uh, did some underwater archaeological work in the Black Sea and just re uh, miraculously somehow found a 5th century BC uh, Grecian urn in the sea, uh, just by luck, I assume, of course, <laughs> and numerous others. But I'm sorry that one didn't work, so I have to get to. But here it is if you want to see it. And now I need, let, let's get back to the main PowerPoint and hopefully this, well, we need to, uh, well, whatever, it didn't work, so we'll yeah. just let, say goodbye to, anyway, you can get the 2018 for yourself and let me, what do we got here? Here we get back to where I'm supposed to be. Um, hmm. That's right, what a, uh, Uh, nothing works. <clears throat> well, folks, so much for the PowerPoint, I'm afraid. Do you have some special skill here? That... Oh, I might. I don't know. Let's see what you want here. So did you try doing your slideshow? Yeah, it, it worked just fine. And this is the cover? Pardon? This is the, the this is the first slide. So you got everything connected. Do you have that photo any place other than right here? Uh, ye yes, I do on this. But in your um, in no. your stuff. Here. No. Now that this this is the slideshow. Right there. What? 
Okay, do we have it? All right. <clears throat> All right, I apologize for that. Always a technological glitch. Let me begin with a few thoughts and then um, let us try to turn to a few more serious observations. We have entered a state of extreme risk and tension with the Kremlin and the uh, Russian foreign policy interests. We have come to a point where we exaggerate the nature of the motives of Russia internationally and the stakes that are at, uh, at play in a number of key issues. Let us be frank. There are extreme perils emerging on the international landscape. Terrorism strikes me as one. Immigration and the problems of controlling immigration across the European continent strikes me as another. The crisis of NATO, the crisis of the European Union, all of these things seem to portend to me great dangers on the international horizon. I have good news and bad news for you. Russia is a problem, that's the bad news, in the sense that it has chosen to challenge a number of key international areas. The good news is it's not a major problem, it's a secondary problem. None of these issues are irreconcilable and on virtually all of them, it seems that Moscow is quite willing to negotiate. And Moscow repeatedly says on so many of them we should be cooperating, not being antagonistic. I mean this very seriously. A broader point we all have to keep in mind when we think about Vladimir Putin. Any political figure in the United States would give anything for his poll ratings. His poll ratings generally at their lowest have been about 65 to 67%. Occasionally now they might dip as low as 73 to 75%, but normally they keep right around 81 to 83%. Now you're all skeptical, I know you're all looking at me like, oh sure, these are all fake polls, right? No, they're not, they're actually a legitimate poll. It's a perfect strategy. There is a Western funded polling organization that operates out of Moscow called Levada. It operates without significant interference by the Kremlin or the Russian regime. Now this is a bit of an anomaly because if we had the time to elaborate, I would point to the significance that over the last two to three years, Putin has consistently tightened the control over foreign NGOs that might operate inside Russia. They have to register as foreign agents. They have to go through a very complex registration process that is almost impossible to complete. This is true of almost every foreign NGO, especially those sponsored, by the way, by George Soros. Uh, but it is not true of that public opinion poll I just mentioned. So why is that public opinion poll, Western-led, Western-financed, with Western expertise, allowed to function? The reason is so I can do just what I just did to say the polls in regard to Putin are accurate. He wants you to know that in point of fact, he has a strong base of popular support. I will try to explain this <coughs> to you as best I can by looking at a series of the issues that he has championed, but you must understand that that is the case. Putin, as you probably know, the exciting news, has decided he's going to run in the campaign in 2018. Uh, so he will enter the presidential campaign in 2018. I'm betting he's going to win. <laughs> but if he, let's assume he wins, that means that he will serve in the presidency through 2014. That, pardon? I'm sorry, 2024, excuse me. Through 2024, he will have served 27 years in the presidency of, or the prime ministry of, of Russia, which is longer than any other political figure in 20th century Russian history. Some of you, I know, want to raise your hand and quibble and say, what about Stalin? The problem with Stalin is it's kind of hard to say when his regime started. 
That is, in the 1920s, he was a member of various uh, coalition governments. So that the hard facts are technically in a position of unique executive power, Putin will have outdone Stalin in terms of longevity. But for our purposes, what's extremely important is Putin has done two things that will not disappear with, when he leaves. He has transformed the post-Cold War international order from a system in the 1990s that put Russia at great disadvantage to a situation now where Russia is a player again and a force in the international community. I will elaborate more in a moment, but that's exactly what he wanted and that's what he promised. Russia is back at the table again. Domestically, he has restored the authority of the central government, reshaped institutions that appear to have far greater stability and effectiveness than what he inherited before. He will be the one that shapes the economic, excuse me, the political culture of Russia for generations to come. The key to understanding Putin in part is to understand that he inherited a country that was in shambles. I remember Boris Yeltsin very fondly um, in my earlier phase of my career. I had the privilege um, and sometimes interesting episodes to have met him and interviewed him several times. He was a likable, charming, kind of a buffoon. Um, but however likable he might have been, he had presided over a near shipwreck of a country through the 1990s. When Vladimir Putin emerged in power in 1999, and officially in 2000, you have to understand Russia was in a pre-crisis situation. That government would have collapsed. The country was on the verge of disaster. The Russian public gives him credit for stopping the decline and beginning the long road to a comeback. The general belief is that Russia had been humiliated by the United States. Russia had, and the West, Russia in the 1990s was brought down to its knees. It had no international respect. And the thing that everybody gives to Putin, the credit they give him, is he brought Russia off its knees. He made Russia a force to be respected again, and he assumed, at first without invitation, but now it's his, Russia has a seat at the international table again. Well, let me say, one of the things I began um, in a certain parody that I think is a bit irresponsible on my part is, maybe that's why the calendar joke didn't work. Um, we can make fun of Putin, and I'm going to talk a bit about what we'd call his cult of personality. This is an old term from communism in the 1920s, by the way. It was usually first leveled against Leon Trotsky, and then later leveled against Stalin. And we can smile at what appears to be going on, at how Putin is glorified in the um, popular culture of Russia. But before I do that, <clears throat> let me ask, can you think of any other presidents who have this kind of glorification? <laughs> and you don't have to go back too far. Uh, remember Ronald Reagan with his shirt off, splitting logs out at the ranch? Or go to Italy, remember Silvia Berlusconi? Um, it's not that unusual for this kind of thing to take off in a cultural context. But we know the stories about Putin. I've already shared about the diving in the deep sea, uh, saving wildlife. Um, he is a master of judo. You can, in fact, get a videotape, uh, this is a DVD, excuse me, by now, I assume, with a book that com comes with it called Let's, Let's Do Judo with Vladimir Putin, where it's kind of like a Jane Fonda uh, routine where he teaches you judo. He is quite accomplished in that. There are many aspects to this that I like. Lately, there's been a lot of kind of attempts to humanize him. One of my favorites is there, 
if you look back, all you have to do is Google this, uh, Putin Fats Domino, all right, or Putin Blueberry Hill. At a St. Petersburg fundraiser, a charity event, Putin got up and played the piano. He played Fats Domino's Blueberry Hill, and he sang it in English. Now, my reaction to that was, even if you're a KGB agent, if you like Fats Domino, you can't be all bad. But, you know, show he's a little artistic, uh, shows he can sing a bit, and shows he actually does know, just for reference, yes, he does know English. He chooses not to use it uh, in public. He's not a master of it, but he can communicate enough with it, and that's kind of the message he wants to get across. More recently, there was a scene of him in China waiting for an interview with the Chinese representatives, and he just happened, the cameras, there was a TV crew with him, and they just happened to come across a stage where there was a piano, and he walked up and he played a traditional um, Russian popular ballad, Moscow Windows, it's called, played it rather well, and two or three other sentimental Russian ballads. Uh, not a master, but good enough. The point is they're trying to show the human kind of cultivated uh, cultured side of the man. My favorite of the Putin stories, however, is one where he staged an event to show that Russia was emerging as a great auto manufacturer again. He took the, the Russian car of Soviet era, was called the Lada. It has been reissued as a a joint venture with Western partners to create a new Lada. I tried to buy one not too long ago, by the way. Um, and to show that it is not like the old one, it's durable, it's functional, it's a great car, it can be a great off-road vehicle. And how did he do this? He and one other driver accompanied him. He, was, he drove a Lada from St. Petersburg all the way to the Pacific to Vladivostok. And along, it was just he in the Lada with a driver. They did have a professional from Russian television TV crew follow the event showing their heroic leader driving across the country into Siberia and so on and so forth. What delights me about this anecdote is it revealed that Putin, like me, and many a politician, hadn't quite gotten into the iPhone age. And of course, what they didn't realize, well, they were producing this glorified tape of him driving across the country, all of the villagers had iPhones who were, you know, <laughs> taking videos of it. So it went all out over the social media, and the truth was there were over a hundred vehicles in the convoy. There were two additional Ladas, and of course, uh, Putin turned into a bit of a joke. Well, um, I can go on and on about this. I, I rather like to, but um, I'll end, I guess, with one other anecdote. Um, if I can find it here, if we got, there, it is, this product came out in December just in time for the holidays, it might be a good idea for you to take a look into it, to pick it up for that perhaps a gentleman you want something uh, to give a special gift to. It is a new c cologne called Leaders, number one, the profile looks a lot like Putin's profile. And you can find it, I'm not making this up, you can find it uh, on the web. It's pretty pricey though, from about $150 to $250 for an ounce. And it says, by the way, it has a powerful scent. <laughs> well, let me move on, because I'm not going to be, we will not be playing the... Let's talk more seriously and come back to Putin and his personality in a moment. Um, think back as to how you might remember in international affairs the era of the post-Cold War, the 1990s. Think back on what you might have thought of America's role in that period. And then think as how the Russians might have experienced it. Let us talk directly. For an empire that collapsed the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, a global multinational empire collapsed. 
It did so in a remarkably orderly fashion. Few empires dissolve themselves with such a relative lack of stress as happened in that event. Do try to remember that before you dismiss Russians as hopelessly politically incompetent or innately authoritarian, please note that empire did dissolve. However, it dissolved with greater expectations than could have been realized. First of all, it assumed that it would be a partner, a global partner with the United States thereafter. It was called the Partnership for Peace. Russia was not admitted to NATO, but it was given an observer, an advisory status. The dream of Reagan and Gorbachev had been that, that Russia and the United States could finally com combine to do really serious things, really major global problems could be worked on together, and so on and so forth. That never materialized. It assumed it would be more integrated into the Western economic life. You tell me sometime. Why is it that the European Union is a club to which Russia is never invited? What is it? It is European, after all. Think about it for a while. Why is it always excluded from these clubs? And if this is the message you want to send, you are sending a direct message that maybe Russia um, should look more towards itself or towards the East than towards the West in its uh, hopes for the future. Well, Russia has a list of grievances. You ask any Russian, and they will itemize them one at a time. About the 1990s. We bombed Serbia, for example, without UN Security Council approval. You and I can see and argue about this. We perhaps saw it. I was quite involved in that issue as interve intervention to preempt genocide. We saw it as human rights. Perhaps we saw it as democracy. Russia saw it as bombing its most historic traditional ally and friend. In the idiom of Eastern Europe, the Serbs always refer to themselves as Russia's little brother. It is the closest diplomatic ally Russia has had in minor in modern history. Russia sees these events as our attempt to undermine a Russian interest in foreign policy, and in this case, to humiliate it. We could say that something of the same about Iraq. We also intervened and attacked in Iraq, a traditional associate of Russia, a traditional interest of Russia, again, without Security Council approval. So these are the types of things that we don't seem to have any perception of as to why the Russians would take such extreme anxiety over these actions. <clears throat> but let me end with basically kind of three examples. Number one, why have we expanded NATO eastward? Why have we expanded NATO eastward? Are you prepared to volunteer and defend the borders of Ukraine? That is the part of the, the NATO clause. Are you? Are you going to defend Latvia? How about Georgia? Uh, how about intervention in the Caucasus Mountains? Why, in, in 1997, under the Clinton administration, the move was taken to first advance Russia into countries of the former Warsaw Pact? the Czech Republic, Poland, Hungary. From 2000 to 2004, the initiative went to ad advance NATO into countries that were formerly republics of the Soviet Union, the Baltic nations, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania. And then we'll come to this in a little bit more in a moment. But coming up in 2014, entertaining that Ukraine could conceivably become part of NATO. I skipped one along the way. 2008, that Georgia was encouraged by the Bush administration that there would be an accelerated um, process to bring Georgia into NATO. Now, let me try to be succinct and direct. First of all, I'm asking this, your intelligent audience, I assume you follow international affairs, I assume you're politically active, 
Was there ever an adequate public debate in the 90s about this policy? Why doesn't it come up in election time? And what is, what is it? Are we really prepared to provide security defense for these new members of NATO? If that was ever discussed, what do you think the public reaction is? Now, Russians will ask you, this makes no sense. We are no, and especially in the 90s, we are no threat to you. You know, we, our relations are normal. They cannot understand why in time of peace this action would occur. It is, if Russia is the enemy Americans love to hate, NATO is the enemy Russians love to hate. They, and it cuts across all political spectrums in Russia, from liberal to conservative, almost all of the country oppose and see as a threat the eastward expansion of NATO. I will give you one simple, my favorite example, the, uh, of a friend of ours, Mikhail Gorbachev, the last president of the Soviet Union, the architect together with Reagan of the end of the Cold War, a diplomatic genius in many respects, that the together they orchestrated really what was one of the greater diplomatic transfers of modern history. If you ask Gorbachev, and he's on the news all the time, anytime NATO comes up, Gorbachev is brought up, and he will tell you, he will fulminate on this point, because he was part of the negotiations that unified Germany. And he will say that there was an absolute agreement by the ambassador to the, from the United States, Jack Matlock, that NATO would not expand eastward with the expansion of Germany. There was an agreement by a, a Dieter Genscher, the foreign minister of Germany. NATO would not expand eastward. And Gorbachev says, the Americans promised it would not go the length of a thumb eastward. Matlock, uh, by the way, confirmed that that was the case. The German foreign minister actually lied and said it wasn't until his papers were revealed that detailed that that was the offer they had made. So what I'm trying to say is the Russians feel terribly, deeply betrayed by this gesture. And what is the point of it? I'll come back to that in a little bit in a second. Why have we revoked the ABM treaty? What is the point? Are we, why are we planning to put a missile defense shield in Central Europe? Russians, why would we have walked away from that treaty, which was kind of essential to nuclear weapons and arms control, and why? What is the point of our attempting to put a missile shield now into Central Europe? The Russians simply cannot fathom unless it has some ulterior purpose and message for Russia. And then we come to the Obama administration and regime change. Putin has consistently, consistently opposed moves by the United States towards regime change. It cannot help but notice that regime change seems to always occur among Russian associates, uh, nations with whom Russia has a long history of trade, policy, interaction, and so on. Uh, we can comment, we, maybe we have other motives for why this is, but from Putin's point of view, uh, Libya, Iraq, Syria? Is that what's going on in Syria? Why are they always their clients who are subject to regime change. And Putin will tell you repeatedly again and again and again and again and again. What makes you so sure that you bring on a regime change, say in Syria, say in Libya? What makes you so sure that the outcome will be better than the situation that preceded it? And secondly, why don't you notice that these countries are closer to his borders than to ours? Or that he, on his southern frontier, has a large Islamic insurgency already? Do you see what I mean? When we say regime change, it seems to Putin to always be changing Russian clients. And he tries to encourage us to rethink the whole concept. Let's... Um, let me try to walk us through a few steps. So how did Putin reverse the course of things? He was slow, calculated. In the year 2000, he could do almost nothing. 
The Russian military was in shambles. He tried a few military exercises. You might remember the submarine curse disaster. There were a series of just disastrous moves as he tried to revitalize the military, but it was not successful. But he bided his time. Step one, 2008, the Georgian country of, excuse me, the Caucasian country of Georgia. A pro-Western government came to power in Tbilisi. The Bush administration, particularly Cheney, cultivated them, argued they should be put on the fast track towards membership in NATO, accelerated privileges in the European Union. Here it is, we thought at last, <clears throat> in the Caucasus, we would have a friend and ally. The problem is that Georgia had been part of the Russian paradigm of power since the 19th, 18th century, actually, but since 1814, now that I have to drop a date, it had long been part of Russia, part of the Soviet Union as well, and Putin had a few cards to play. He, there is a minority within Georgia known as Ossetians. They are not Slavic, uh, they are not Georgian, they are of Turkic background, like many of the minorities of Central Asia and the Caucasus region. But like many of them also, they are not anti-Russian. In fact, they're pro-Russian. They see Moscow as their protector against the Georgians. They felt themselves were the vic they were the victim of discrimination. They felt they would be second-class citizens in this new Georgian state that was unfolding. And when the Georgian government moved uh, several military units closer to the Ossetian border, it was like they fell on a tripwire. The Russian forces, basically special forces, were all prepared. In August of 2008, within a few days, they drove across Ossetia, occupied it. They would later declare it to be a, like a protectorate of Russia. Uh, it is a, one of several of these states that have been left now that it is friendly to Russia, it is autonomous, and does not recognize the government in Georgia. Georgia does not recognize it. So why did Putin do this? A country that n none of us probably know much about, if a con con country, I suspect, I do not mean to be patronizing at all, that many of you probably had never heard of before. Why did he do it? It was a message. Message for whom? Number one, the government of Georgia and the government of any other states that formerly were part of the Soviet Union that might be contemplating now that they should join NATO and pursue closer ties with the West. A quick message to them. Russia still is a military force in the area. Did you notice? Moscow tells Tbilisi, the Americans didn't come to help you there, did they? A message to Europe. This is a Russian sphere of influence. Our interests must be respected. And you can't militarily do much about it. So first unit in, the first step for Putin was, in effect, to exercise Russian authority and stop Western expansion into the Caucasus. Step two, the spring of 2014, the Ukraine and um, Crimea, which was then part of Ukraine. Step two. This requires a, a rather convoluted history, so I'll keep it very short. The government of Kiev at the time, Yanukovych, was a pro-Russian, closely allied to Stalin, <laughs> oops, closely allied to Putin, and was overthrown in a wave of popular demonstrations that sent him packing eventually into exile, and today he lives in the Russian city of Rostov. The Georgian government quickly moved to increased closer economic ties and accept aid from the European Union. It called for help from NATO. It called for arms and weapons from the United States and NATO as well. And it invited then in March of 2014 uh, Intervention by Moscow. Step one, volunteers, they're called, volunteers. Russian patriots and volunteers went down to protect the Crimea. And these are the Russian units do not carry a Russian insignia. They're technically not state 
players. I'm sorry, this wire keeps bothering me, so I guess I've got to go back here. Um, <clears throat> and they are sometimes mercenaries. They admit to being mercenaries. Otherwise, they supposedly are patriotic volunteers. They moved quickly and easily to occupy the Crimean Peninsula. And then to the north, they moved to occupy the pro-Western uh, areas of eastern Ukraine. And today, that area, is, the Russians call it again, it's been formed into kind of a renegade state. It's called Donbass in Russia. Let me elaborate a bit on kind of two aspects of the conflict, Ukraine and also what the Crimea signifies and what this might tell us about Putin's objectives. Or Ukraine. Ukraine was brought into the Russian political empire by Catherine the Great in the 18th century. It has called from the late 18th century into the 20th century, Novaya Russia, New Russia. Ukraine and Russia have a long history of very close ties. 38% of the population of Ukraine identifies Russian as their first language. Probably the numbers are much, much higher. Russians feel that Ukraine and Russia share a history. They share a future. The two cannot be separated. Russians may uh, have their own biased interpretation of the history between the two, but Putin's message was quite simple. The U Ukraine is going to stay within a Russian sphere of influence. The Crimea is much more sensitive than Ukraine itself. The Crimea, uh, to all Russians that I have known since the end of the Cold War, after a few vodkas, everybody says the same thing in Russia, regardless of their politics. The Crimea, how can the Crimea not be part of Russia? How many read Chekhov in here? They, they, come on, this is, this is the Crimea. Uh, it is, I have, all my Russian friends have daches down there. It, they, it's absurd. Do you know how the Crimea became part of Ukraine? Uh, Nikita Khrushchev, Premier Nikita Khrushchev, who liked his drinks a bit, was partying with the Politburo leadership. And several representatives of, of what was the Ukrainian Socialist Federated Republic, the Soviet Republic, were there. And they're drinking and they're having a good time. And Khrushchev came up with the brilliant idea. We will give the Crimea, which was part of the Russian Republic, to the Ukrainian Republic to show Ukrainian-Russian friendship. Great gesture. Now, in Soviet times, this is meaningless. Meaningless. I exaggerate for the point of, I went to Wisconsin over the weekend. In my judgment, there's a bigger difference between the Minnesota-Wisconsin border than there was between most of the Republic borders of the old Soviet Union. Uh, signs might change a little bit, a little language change here and there. But in Soviet times, it made no difference if you said Crimea was part of Ukraine. Once the Soviet system collapsed, it makes a big difference. A big difference for two reasons. Number one, Russian national sentiment. The Crimea, it's ours. This is our territory historically. Secondly, the Black Sea fleet is stationed there in Sevastopol. That is Russia's formidable global naval fleet, and in particular, absolutely essential for its presence in the Eastern Mediterranean. Under the current agreement, uh, sorry, <laughs> under the current agreement, Moscow leases had leased Sevastopol, the harbor in Crimea, uh, to the Russians. Well, the Russians, number one, don't see why they lease to us. But, or what if it becomes part of NATO? What if NATO says you can't lease that base to the Russians to come back to it? So this made it the most obvious argument that Putin could have for moving in, annexing, staging a referendum, and putting Crimea was then integrated back into Russia. But let me elaborate to try to get a better point out of this. There was actually a great argument in the Kremlin 
at the, in the spring of 2014 over how Russia should conduct itself. There were two strong points of view. The two strong points of view were, number one, there were those who argued we should do this legally. We should invite an internationally monitored referendum in Crimea to give them the choice, do you want to be independent, a Crimean state? Uh, do you want to be part of Ukraine? Uh, do you want to be part of Russia? Because Why would they offer this? Because they know they're going to vote 90% in favor of being part of Russia. But that would give it a perfect you know, legitimacy. Why not? The others argued no. You must show them, as you show them in the caucus, that Russia is a force to be recognized. Putin did it with military force because that's the way he does things. And he did not want to be beholden to some international monitoring group about what he and how he might conduct his affairs in Crimea. Now, <clears throat> for all of us, regretfully, I wish he hadn't taken that option. But nevertheless, that, it's important to note that there was the other option on the table. Speaking of Ukraine and uh, the Crimea for just a moment, the other side of this story that's so essential uh, is this is a soluble program, a problem. It, there have been pr proposals on the table now for several years. Those involved in the diplomatic negotiations, you know, some form of referendum, the admission that the state of Ukraine needs some form of reorganization. There should be options for some regions to become autonomous, options for some reason, regions to become part of Russia, but it's soluble. But for whatever reasons, both Moscow and Washington have gone feral on this. They have both taken an exceptionally hard line. And now we come to another phase of Putin's last step that brings us to the present. It is now quite obvious that Russia is working and mastering a new weapon, cyber warfare. It has been doing this for some time now. It had interfered in Poland's uh, computing, electric, uh, computing systems. It had interfered, interviewed in the Baltic states. It's obviously been honing this down, and they decided to give it a try of uh, of, in dealing with the United States in the elections. I'm going to propose uh, for a moment, I want to make a transition to talk about the relationship with, of Putin and Trump, uh, to analyze what that's the state of relations are, and um, to wrap things up with a larger perspective. But I'm mindful of the clock. I'm going to suggest I would welcome a few questions at the moment before I turn to Trump and Putin, you have a microphone and, there, And Judy? I do have the microphone. Um, Any and questions I would... or comments on so far? And we'll, I'll come to Trump okay. in just a moment. Here we go. Sure. Um, now that you bring up Trump, it's good. I think uh, a lot of people now, people here are older, you may remember the economist, former presidential candidate, Lyndon LaRouche, who of Trump say he's getting the LaRouche treatment because he dared to say that we should end geopolitics. We shouldn't have this forever and ever war with Russia and also China. Now, um, I think the key block to this though is economics. And uh, one of, the, of uh, the current drive here of geopolitics and what started thinking of Ukraine was China's 2013 Xi Jinping's announcement that he's gonna go with the New Silk Road, Belt and Road Initiative. I realize I'm bringing a whole nother element into here, but what China's doing is huge. The biggest infrastructure project in human modern history, big, 20 times bigger than the Marshall Plan. And they're claiming they're gonna end poverty in China by 2020. So I just, if you could add in, I think the economic element of what we're going through and the collapse in Europe here with the Wall Street collapsing and they're going to, into panic mode of something that LaRouche is kind of an expert at, I think. We have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Stop. Because, I mean. Stop. We need a real question instead of election. Well, this is a question. I'm asking, can we put in the, the new Silk Road? Hey, I'm asking a question. The new Silk Road is global win-win economic development. Do you think the United States should join that? 
If the question is, do I think the United States should join the New Silk Road, my answer would be, I don't think they'll be invited. Um, they, they, they already did. That's I, I think we have limited time. We're going to be lo losing our TV we, connection in just have, 10 minutes. So could we have some other questions before we lose our TV connection? Who has a question, please? Excuse me, but who has a question? Yes, sir. There's a question over here. Yes, ma'am. Okay, we do have limited time here, so let's try to get as many people questions as possible. Professor, I hope I'm not jumping ahead on you here, but I was just wondering, um, <clears throat> it's been said in many times in articles that uh, Putin definitely didn't want Hillary Clinton to win the election simply because she would be a continuation of uh, Obama's sanctions, and sanctions are a huge deal in Russia. Uh, Exxon Mobil lost, they claim, billions of dollars in oil while the sanctions were on. It really hurt Russia. Any comments on that? Why don't we do this? Um, yes, Putin, um, Putin had many more reasons than just sanctions for disliking Hillary Clinton. Um, my idea of taking a break for questions, though, I th I, I'm moving into that topic right now. Why don't I just go ahead? Uh, I will announce when the and, and I'll just, uh, we've just changed our program here a little bit. We will be televising till 2.30. So oh, okay. we'll have plenty of time for questions and this disposition. All right, let us then turn as I try to introduce. To, to, to revisit the relationship with Putin and, and Trump. Are we coming up? All right, there's been a great deal written about the affinities of the two men, their apparent mutual admiration, and so on and so forth. Let me say a few things about maybe the personal background to the, do, the two. By temperament, they have very similar personalities in some respects. Their political in, inclinations are nationalist. Trump says, make America great again. Putin is one of the few Russian politicians in office who says, I am a great Russian nationalist. And he says that proudly without equivocation. It has always been his position. They are both kind of uh, womanizers, frankly. Uh, Putin also is rather open in his flirtation and he has this kind of false chivalric behavior around women and so on and so forth. <clears throat> They both benefited by the fact their opponents grossly underestimated them. They both believe in what uh, Trump quoted as sovereign nations about six months ago. The idea that the international community should build, be really a web of sovereign nations. Uh, Putin believes the same thing. Putin takes a phrase from Charles de Gaulle about what Europe governance should be. It should be uh, a Europe of the nations, uh, meaning that the international community, at least of Europe, should be as it was in the 19th century, really a paradigm of power governed by the great powers, that is, Russia, Britain, Germany, France. He invites the United States into it. But you could, in other words, rather than international organizations like the European Union or like uh, the UN, the idea is that the sovereign heads of the great nations somehow best represent the community of modern times. And they both further cults of personality, as I've already digressed. I don't need to elaborate on Trump, I'm no specialist on Trump, but you know, as I've tried to indicate, Putin clearly allow, if, allows this, if he didn't like this glorification of his personality and character, he could stop it in a minute if he felt like it. So clearly he does not mind it. But I cannot help but wonder, there are such essential differences between the two men. Putin is slow. He calculates things in the long term. Trump, as I understand, is impulsive, uh, spontaneous. Spontaneous is not an adjective that has ever been applied uh, to Putin. Putin is, to be frank, extremely knowledgeable in history and international relations. He's a, 
a well-educated person. He shows the so old Soviet university system worked pretty well. Uh, you know, he, and he's proud of that. You know, and he, he can engage foreign leaders in serious conversations. And yes, he is fluent in German. That's, that's why he always talks to Andrea Markel at these gatherings. He's fluent in German. And why is he fluent in German? It's, he was a KGB agent in East Germany. That was, I'm not, this isn't a secret. That's, so, you know, he, he's quite cosmopolitan. As I mentioned before, he does speak English. I always mention footnote, yes, I met him once, and he very briefly spoke English long ago, kind of confirming what I would have suspected that he actually did, but, you know, um, I, I claim on my resume to speak French, but I wouldn't dare uh, do it in public, so, you know, something like that, that he does have that command. But there's other things that we need to be more serious about. Putin is a child of poverty and deprivation. His mother almost died in the siege of Leningrad. His father was a partisan fighter in the siege of Leningrad. He grew up in a tough working class district of Leningrad. He worked his way up through the old Soviet system. He did. It, he is an example of, in effect, a poor kid for whom the Soviet system worked and worked well, if you follow. So he is very proud of that and hence very proud of those institutions. He doesn't have, if you will, maybe the natural self-confidence that comes with an elite, privileged, wealthy background. He, that is not part of him. He is a bit defensive. There's another thing about their style of leadership that to me is so different. Putin respects norms. He argues strenuously about the norms of diplomatic and political protocol and conduct. Why? Because he wants to show that Russia is one of the traditional powers, that he knows how to behave, he understands protocol and the basic norms of political behavior. I do not want to get in an argument about Trump, but I suspect Trump is quite different on that point. <laughs> Let me share with you a moment as we move on that occurred to me on Minnesota Public Radio in December 2016. I, I do a couple programs a year with my wonderful friend and colleague Gary Eichton of NPR. <clears throat> and these are usually like an hour long program on either from Russia or after I've returned from Russia. And in December 2016, Gary Eichton asked me on the air, do you think Putin could be blackmailing Trump? There was dead silence. I said, yes followed by dead silence. <laughs> I have worked in public radio a lot. I've been on public TV a lot, if you forgive the immodesty. I have often been surprised by the reaction of listeners and viewers and the volumes that come in. My one word, yes, appeared to be the most interesting thing I ever said in my career. <laughs> I just flooded. And again, I had to defend myself. I'm just a guy from Collegeville, Minnesota right now. All right, please. I, uh, but so let's talk maybe why I can say this or what I think. And I, I'm sharing this with you as a Russian, longtime Russia watcher. Trump's story of his connections in Russia read almost like a soap opera skit of how the KGB entraps what's called an asset. He was cultivated to be an asset. So there's three steps to this, three steps. Step one, kompromat, a little bit of compromising information or material, a little something that might embarrass, humiliate, or uh, the subject something that it's useful to let this, make sure the subject knows you have this, even if you don't show it. Compromat. Two, follow the money. Step two is you draw them into some kind of financial transaction of some kind. Um, and all of these transactions are going to have legal problems either with the United States or with Russia. I have worked in my career off and on as a consultant to various American corporations and 
nobody could ever figure out the laws, uh, ultimately. I mean, there was, it was almost impossible to get through any transaction without technically violating some laws. But here, that is a much more serious matter of really drawing the subject into some serious financial um, shenanigans. And when that is all set up, who knows when it'll be? It can be uh, some time off. It could be years off. You ask the favor. That is, something political is asked. Now, let me step back. Do I know this? No, but I, do I know how they act? Yes, I know how. I've, I've seen these stories time and time again. I always share, uh, I, I don't want to sound puritanical, <coughs> but um, watching the behavior of a number of very prominent American businessmen and CAO types in Russia in the 1990s, which is the time that Trump started going there, he begins begin to wonder if there's something in the Russian water that causes them to really lose their judgment. I did a, I did a TV story about 1996 for Channel 2. It was actually on Minnesota's businesses in Moscow. All right, it was, you know, Kurt Carlson was portrayed, and it was, you know, and a number of interesting entrepreneurs from Minnesota that went over there. But we had to wrap it up at the end of the story. And um, there, there is a hotel in Moscow, it's called the Slavyanskaya, uh, but it was originally uh, taken over by the Radisson Corporation. It was the main Radisson hotel. Radisson today has sold it to SAS Scandinavian Airlines. But it was a, a joint Russian Radisson venture, and it was the center of Western, especially American, trading and business in Moscow. So you went into there, into the lounge, and that's where you saw. The Russians call it chemadon banking, uh, briefcase banking, because you know huge briefcases full of cash, and they go back and forth. Uh, I was not doing investigative journalism, and let me get to my point. I told the cameraman we needed a wide shot of this lounge, this bar, just you know, just to kind of show the wheeling and dealing that's going on. Okay. Um, and I am coming back to a point. I looked at the audience, and I thought, oh. There were the faces of a number of very prominent representatives of the Minnesota business community. Gentlemen, and I don't want to be tacky, but unless a number of them really had decided to take their daughters with them to Moscow, <laughs> this just didn't look right. And I said, I said to the cameraman, Peter, I said, pull it off. No, we, we don't do that kind of reporting, okay. And, you know, I'm not here to create strife back home in Minneapolis. But what I, I've tried, it, it was so rife with this kind of stuff. It was like a joke uh, all across Moscow. And frankly, do I suspect that that's how they lured in President uh, Trump at the time? Yes, of course, it would seem to me too obvious. Do I have hard data for this? No, of course I don't. But nevertheless, it seems so obvious. The simple thing, to me, that is most significant. Is there any other leader on the world stage that Trump has not criticized? There has never been a critical comment about Vladimir Putin. Not one. Never really a criticism of Russia, Russian policy. Not one. I don't, you know, I'm, you can figure out the rest of the story as well as I can. Yeah. So l let's say just a few things, what does Putin want out of this? Um, it's an old story. Trump isn't the only one, I'm sure. The cultivation of a significant American business person who could be sympathetic, who could speak to Moscow's interests, who could perhaps lobby regarding things like sanctions, trading bills, and so on and so forth. Uh, they have done this before, and that's how I'm sure the story with uh, Trump started. The question of sanctions came later in the story, by the way, and therefore you would think, so to bring the story up after 2014 into the election, it would be useful to have an influential American business person, now political person, who would have that view and maybe could lobby against the sanctions. Somebody mentioned this, I'm sorry I can't remember who, but it is quite true. Putin hated Hillary, hates Hillary Clinton. That's one thing I guess he has in common with Trump. Uh, they see most of their problems developing in the Obama administration. And all you have to do at any time, go back, look up, go Google Hillary Clinton and Vladimir Putin. Look at the body language between the two when they met. 
it's clear they do not like them. So from Putin's point of view, what was he doing? He wanted to undermine the stability of what he assumed would be a Clinton presidency. Uh, a Russian friend of mine, a journalist, said, we're not stupid. You think we actually thought Trump was going to, we read the polls. You know, we, no, we wanted just to create dissent, to make it look suspect, to increase the divisions in the American public, and to undermine what they thought would be the coming of four years of Hillary Clinton. In the end, it, is it possible that several hackers, maybe with Putin's approval, said, you know, we just might make this a lot more close than you think, or it's possible we could tip this? I don't know. Uh, I could only speculate, but yeah, perhaps at the end it was uh, possible. But nevertheless, um, I do think the real intent has been achieved by the fact we're having this conversation right now. That is to undermine the legitimacy of the election. His only mistake was he thought it would be Hillary's election, not Trump's. Let me step back to a few larger issues and try to tie a few things together. Um, it's often, I'm often asked, does Putin really have an ideology? The answer is probably not really. In this respect, he's very much like Trump. Um, he governs mainly by instincts, inclinations. He's not an advocate of any particular ideology. He's often identified with a movement in Russia known as National Bolshevism. Um, National Bolshevism is an idea that goes back to the 1920s. It revived greatly in the 1990s, was the idea that the fusion of Russia's future, its place would be the fusion of the communist revolution with the Russian national tradition. It had become a fairly active political party in the 1990s, a little less so now, <clears throat> but was one of the main opposition parties and had a very strong following among the younger generation of Russians. Its head is an interesting character out of Russian literature. His name is Eddie, he goes by Eddie, but Edvard Limonov, who is a prominent writer, uh, translated well across Europe. He's written a great memoir, It's Me, Eddie. Um, and he, it's often argued that Limo, Limonov may be defining the ideology that will take shape uh, in Putin's time. But another one is Alexander Dugin. He calls himself, self, it's an, again a movement that came out of Russia in the 1920s. It's called Eurasianism. It is an attempt that argue that Russia is neither East nor West, but a unique synthesis of both and it has its own separate political traditions, which are autocratic. It has a unique tie to the Russian Orthodox Church. It has never been, nor ever will be, part of the Western family of nations. And it is fascist in many of its leanings. Its head, Dugan, by the way, has uh, appeared, been, he's been interviewed by um, Steve Bannon. His comments have appeared in Bannon's publications. And so you could say there is that tie there. But the truth is, my friends, I don't think Putin really cares about any of these. People say this is what he believes or what he should believe, but he never makes any public gesture that he in any case does. One part about Putin I did not mention in passing that is part of this picture, and you should know, Putin is a believing, practicing Russian Orthodox Christian. He's the real one. That is, he was baptized in, com his mother had him baptized. Uh, not a fashionable thing to do in communist Russia, but he was a baptized Christian uh, from his childhood. So therefore, <clears throat> when he appears, as he so often does, he has a confessor, a particular priest whose advice he leans to quite a bit, and they're always shown on TV. Is the John he's very, he's, he's, okay. yeah. he, he's very deferential. Okay. I, I'm gonna have to deputize somebody to carry the mic around. Um, would somebody want to carry the mic around for me? I, I need to step out for just a minute. Those of you who have done this before know exactly what's involved. Thank you very much. I will be back. All right. The point is that Putin is a practicing Russian Orthodox Christian. He's a real believer. It explains that he basically has some very core conservative beliefs uh, that you know he's often attacked for and so on and so forth. He is anti-gay. Uh, you know, he 
has a whole series of kind of moral judgments about the West. But I find it interesting because I keep repeating, he's the real thing. And by that I mean after the fall of communism, virtually every politician in Russia tried to be photographed in church. They're all old communists. You know, and suddenly they're now Christian believers. Um, Yel Boris Yeltsin was once asked, was he going to go into the, uh, Rus uh, into, into the Russian Orthodox Church? And he honestly said, no, I've been a communist all of my life. That would be extremely hypocritical of me. And he said, my mother is a practicing believer, and please just leave her alone. Don't follow her with cameras to church and so on. And Gorbachev said much the same thing. No, he... He certainly admires the church, but he's, you know, a cultural Russian. He is not practicing, and it would be the ultimate hypocrisy for him to pretend like these other politicians that he suddenly found the faith. Well, let me maybe wrap up things with a few thoughts as we put Putin together. It's been one great year for Vladimir Putin. <laughs> he's humbled his opposition. That has been his primary political obsession for the last year is not us, it's not Trump, it's elections that are coming in March in 2018. This, he imagines, he wants it to come off successfully as the others have, without questions, without hesitation. So therefore he is willing to show his dark side. Yes, he does harass political opponents. Yes, he threatens with arrest and legal entanglements. His most important political rival <coughs> which is a man by the name of Alexander Navalny. That is true. Why does he do this, you want to ask, if I'm telling you that he's so popular. Why does he do this? For the same reason Mayor Daley used to rig the elections in the city of Chicago. I lived in Chicago for a long time. Why did Daley do this? Because everybody knows that Cook County is going to vote Democratic. So why would he do this again and again and again? Answer is to show he could to send a message to the opposition, yeah, I know I could win this election, but just so you know, um, I do have the ability to be a lot tougher than I am. When he looks at Washington, it's hobbled. It has fallen into such bitter device, divisions and chaos, and Trump probably is music to his political ears in terms of furthering discord, controversies in Europe, and even throwing out compliments back to Vladimir Putin. Putin has emerged as the most credible voice of what I fear is the most powerful and long-term movement of our time. We have seen in the last 10 years the emergence of alt-nationalism, neo-nationalism, right-wing nationalist parties across Europe. Putin, in effect, represents much of that, as does our own President Trump. So we begin to wonder what's next. How will he bring the situation in Syria to an end? I'm optimistic that he will find grounds for a diplomatic compromise with the United States. Uh, will there be a conflict over North Korea? Remember, Russia is also a player in settling North Korea. And could it be a player also in settling the issues of Iran? Let me turn to a larger theme for everybody and pull things back for just a moment. I have talked in dire tones. I've talked about a new Cold War. Excuse me. But let me try to put a few thoughts on Russia in perspective and leave on an optimistic note. There was a very gifted Ch historian of China. He taught at Carleton, Lucian Pai. Some of you may have known who, of him and his work. But he wrote an interesting essay on civilizations versus nations. And he was trying to make the following point. And I always pick on my mother's country. My mother was Swedish. And I don't mean to be petty that way, but um, <clears throat> let's pick on Sweden for a while. Pai would say, Sweden is a nation, but it's not a civilization. And by that he meant there are great multinational nations that are really civilizations that have a global mission, not like a, nor a small territorial nation state. Russia is one of those nations. I don't know how you come up with your own list, but think of it, France, Britain, China. He meant China, of course. The idea that these are large, complex 
entities that in fact define political orders. You cannot define them in terms of other political orders. They represent a complex cultural, social, political, and military matrix of power. And Russia is that kind of power. It reminds me of an old Soviet joke a long time ago when Gorbachev once proposed that Russia should emulate, the Soviet Union should emulate the socialist model of Sweden. And one of Gorbachev's advisors, a conservative, said, that's fine, sir, but Russia's problem is we don't have enough Swedes. <laughs> but in another sense, it also explains why Russians tend to define the nation in mystical, uh, symbolic terms, not in terms that would please a political scientist. A favorite Russian quote that we hear a lot lately is by the Russian poet of the 19th, early 20th century, Fyodor Tutchov. And I will quote it, I have it up on the screen. Russia cannot be by the mind measured or measured by a common mile. Excuse me, I have a typo there. Her status is unique, without kind. Russia can only be believed in. I want to end with a homage to someone who visited St. Paul several times. He got beat up in St. Paul once, by the way. He was attacked by demonstrators. This is all, all ominous. Yevgeny Yevtushenko, the marvelous Russian poet, died last year. Yevtushenko was, uh, he was the beat poet of Russia, emerged in the early 1960s. He was the young, charismatic, liberated Russian. He tantalized audiences across Europe and the United States. He considered that he did all of this at the time, roughly coinciding with the Cuban Missile Crisis, the height of the Cold War, the most dangerous of times. And he represented a different way of thinking to me about Russia and a different sense of hope. And I want to end with my favorite of his poems. It's called, To You People. To you people, along the ulitsa, that's Russian for street, along the ulitsa, streets, along the rue, along the kales, you are walking after work, pushing one another. I am joining you, and I don't repent of it. You've become very weary. You've become very nervy. You've grubbed down in the bowels of the earth. You've reached up to the stars. But it seems to me you haven't begun to exist. In your lips you smoke a camel, a giton, a novosti. And each of you is like a separate novel, a separate heart, a separate conscious. Under every beret, every shlapka, Russian for hat, shlapka, every sombrero, there is a separate measure of the immeasurable world, separating beliefs, into separate compartments. But as you drink your absence, your vodka, your Chianti, just for a moment, you cease to be separate and become humanity in your own eyes. So you can love one another, unite your separate models into one common novel, your separate consciousness into one consciousness. I would like to predict all of this for you, and in this prediction, will not discredit all that I would like to strengthen in life. No, I'm not being a prophet or a judge, but you must forgive me if like a bore I keep nagging and nagging and repeating to you, the people, we are a people, we are a people, we are a people, we argue, grumble, snap, at times we jealously trample on one another. But our separateness, as you know, is false in general. We the people do not exist separately. By forgetting others, you forget yourself. By planning to kill others, you plan to kill yourself. Thank you very much. Um, I, I knew Russia was going to be a controversial subject. <laughs>
I didn't realize how controversial it was going to be. Thank you very much, everyone, for bearing with us through our moments of trouble. We have, we're going to leave our television coverage in just about five minutes. Um, so I, I, there's just time for a couple of questions. If Professor Hayes is able to stay a little longer afterward, there may be time for some informal questions. But let me turn the microphone over. So this last gentleman that you were um, quoting, what is the story about him being beaten up in St. Paul? Yevgeny Yevtushenko, is my microphone still on? Yevgeny Yevtushenko uh, came to give a reading at McAllister College. Uh, I would have to remember the date. It's actually like 1960, yeah, 67, I believe. And because he returned to McAllister College in 87, uh, and ironically in a reading marked the anniversary of what had happened. The name Yevtushenko would lead you, if you are Ukrainian, to believe he was Ukrainian. Okay, that O on the end usually indicates a Ukrainian surname. Ukrainian nationalists hated Yevtushenko because they thought he wasn't Ukrainian. He grew up Russian in Siberia, but they hated him because they thought he was a turncoat. And <clears throat> they came, not unlike that gentleman maybe, um, they, there was a group of them who came to McAllister and attacked him on the stage, threw him off the stage, and fractured several of his ribs. And uh, <laughs> so um, that's the story. And he, uh, I met him in 1987 uh, at the McAllister event, and then met at, thereafter I met him a number of times. But whenever he heard you were from Minnesota, he loved to retell the story of his assault <laughs> at McAllister College. I will tell you my worst faux pas in literary life ever. When I met Yevtushenko, he asked me who was my favorite Russian contemporary poet. And I said, without meeting a, missing a beat, Bela Akhmedulina, who is my favorite contemporary Russian poet, Bela Akhmedulina. And I got the coldest stare on earth. <laughs> I did not realize at the time that that was his first wife. Professor Hayes, this lady has a question. I think we have just time for one more. Maybe. One more question, then. What's going to... Oh. Uh, yes? What, what's going to happen in Syria? What's going to happen in Syria <laughs> is that both parties are going to admit what happened last week shows the extreme danger of what is going on. We're actually American forces on the ground, and Russian, they were said to be mercenaries, uh, had a military encounter in a botched operation executed from Moscow. That, I think, would be a wake-up call. Putin does not want a war over this. They have suggested repeatedly. Russia says its aims have been met. Um, it, they should be able to find diplomatic grounds for bringing this to an end. I did not share with you, any Russian diplomat will tell you, the foreign minister will privately tell our State Department, they can live without Assad. What they want, they want a pro-Russian government if Assad goes. They can't have a pro-Russian government. It's got to be at least neutral. It can't be pro-Western. As for Assad, they've suggested there are many wonderful mansions available outside of Moscow, and uh, it's time to retire, that he could be disposable. He is not cooperating, however. Well, um, I th well thank you very much, and I'm sorry for the intrusion. <laughs> And we look forward to seeing everyone next week, hopefully for a calm presentation on the secret war in Vietnam. Thank you very much.